Oh, oh, hello, hello again. This time last year, I had wrapped up my first tabletop campaign. A month later, I collated my thoughts into a post-mortem video called How to GM. At the end of the video, I questioned where I'd go next. I wanted to do a sequel to my last campaign, but I also wanted to stretch myself and try another setting and system. Turns out I'd do both. I detailed the sequel to my last campaign in my 2020 James of the Year video. This video is about the other big project that I ran. Question Show was a nine week long mini series available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and here on YouTube. In it, I played a game master to a cast of revolving guests that each week would become a new protagonist in a fantasy role playing world. Live role playing isn't exactly a brand new format, but how I went about managing Question Show was, unlike a regular tabletop campaign, the players did not remain consistent between episodes. Rather, the only permanent fixtures was the world the game was set in and a number of key characters. Excitingly, this format meant that I could diversify my usual player base. Although two of my guests were participants in my previous two campaigns, the rest came from a variety of backgrounds, and importantly, had varying levels of experience in role-playing games. This included some guests that had never played a tabletop role-playing game before. However, I didn't want Quest and Show to just be a series of disconnected adventures built around one-off appearances. After all, the appeal of a role-playing game is that you and the other players create a story that develops over the course of the weeks playing it. So I had two challenges to solve. The first was to create a game that even new players could quickly pick up, and the second was creating a game that evolved through all player actions. The solution to the latter was to keep a few things consistent between all the sessions, uh, the setting and most of the non-playable cast. As players made their actions, these things changed, for better or worse. Of course, I couldn't rely on all the players having listened to previous episodes to know these changes. In fact, many of the episodes had been recorded before they started going up. So to remedy this, there was an intriguing hook put in place at the outset that the players could buy into, and it usually served as the foundation of whatever they'd be tasked with doing. In this case, the world was built around the Kingdom of Trotlera which was named by our first player, and roughly translates to Jerkland. Sometime before the beginning of the first episode, the rulers of Trotlera had disappeared, leaving the crown in the hands of their son, Prince Pratt. Prince Pratt was this quavering himbo who sounded like this and found it very difficult to manage Trotlera, so he'd hired these known persons in and outside the kingdom to do it for him. As the players were aware of what the situation was, the only thing left would be to fill them in on what they'd be doing, which often aligned with their skills and expertise. Sometimes we broke from this format, and this is where a lot of cool wrinkles developed. In one particular instance, a player had decided on being a magician's apprentice, with the caveat that their master was a disgraced wizard. We decided the said wizard had once been the magical advisor to Prince Pratt's father, who lost their job when they attempted to usurp the throne by disguising themselves as the king. This unfortunately had been undone by three more regicide attempts happening exactly the same day. This detail had come out of improv, and the players want. We decided that magic was contraband in Trotlera, so the player character had motivation to get Pratt to overturn that. This ended up being a background detail that developed over the next few sessions, and tied directly into another player's quest when Pratt had hired them to make a presentation to Trotlera's government to lift his father's magic ban. Another session started with a player in a neighbouring kingdom who eavesdropped on two characters planning to assassinate Pratt. These characters had previously appeared in an episode prior, when Pratt had sent an investigator to follow a lead on who may have kidnapped his parents. The investigator sold Pratt out to these two, and in return they took that character's pet crow. That pet crow then reappeared sessions later, becoming a new pet for the player that undid Brat's assassination attempt. This system worked really well a lot of the time, though it required material to work with. In the first session, that required a lot of improv, but from that point onwards, we were able to pull in new hooks that all came out of players' actions. And while not every change in Trotlera was wide-reaching, 
Almost all of them got lip service, either by Pratt or another member of the cast. It goes without saying, but Season 2 will be very much built on what happened in Season 1. Though it won't be homework for new players and listeners. But like I said, another challenge was making things simple enough for players to easily perform those actions. Though with enough flexibility that seasoned role players had the room to express themselves. Unfortunately, there was no one pre-built system out there that suited Quest and Show. So, I built my own. So, like, I wanted to get this printed out for this part, but like, old print shops are closed because of COVID, so... Just a, whatever side I put this in, just a moment. It's, it's. The quiz sheet is a PBTA based system designed to track all character details and the rules of the game, nicely on one piece of A4 paper. The intention was for the show and the system to work with each other. It was partially designed to look like a job application form, to fit within the fiction that these were mass produced by Pratt to spread far and wide. The numbered steps in the form follow the structure of the show too, where we'd introduce said characters, how they look, their backstories, their skills and expertise before getting into the adventure. Importantly, the system was built to serve all the functions we needed, but it was also built to streamline out the stuff we didn't. These characters wouldn't have been expected to change much during their sessions, as they instead were agents of change in Trottle Era, so experience points and levelling were completely removed. However, we still wanted characters to be able to specify themselves. From a list of nine, they could choose three core skills, which always gave them a small bonus on making a relevant action. For example, someone who had specialised in persuasion was better at convincing Prince Pratt than someone who hadn't. And these skills were standard and broad attributes like stealth or wisdom. Their expertise was further specification, and was one thing that they had mastered. Magic, firearms, or most excitingly, some that they wrote in themselves. Simply, expertise meant that they weren't characters who were still trying to figure out their roles, but they were known quantities on the adventurer's market. However, there were still elements that could change during the adventure. Harm was a constant threat. Although we always managed to avoid anyone getting KO'd during the series. Inventories too could also be expanded and contracted as certain items could be used to improve their standing. And all these details fed into a simple action system. Simply, what made it a PBTA game was the fact that it was a 2d6 driven system. There was no specific rules for combat, investigation or bluffing. But instead, whenever a player wanted their character to perform an action that was either risky or advantageous, they'd roll two six-sided dice. I hope that wasn't too loud. We'd then factor in the details of their character sheet. So, for example, if they were a very strong character and wanted to scale a wall, we'd factor in their acrobatics and super strength. The player may have rolled an 8, meaning that usually be a mixed success, and there would have been a unforeseen cost or complication to their action. However, we'd add one to the final result for acrobatics, and another one for strength, taking it up to a 10, a critical success, meaning they'd do it without issue. However, if they had been hurt in a previous encounter, we may have factored that into the roll by removing one from the final result, taking us back to 9. As you can see, the quiz sheet made it incredibly fast to calculate the outcome of any action a player would make. It'd then be up to me as the GM to turn that number into a fitting result, such as a fret closing in as they attempted to scale a wall, or a loose brick falling on them, or their trousers falling down halfway up, whatever best fit the moment. Importantly, it would lead to a new decision having to be made. Having quick responses was important, as Question Show was designed to fit within shorter play sessions. This was a concession to guests who, despite being in lockdown, may not have been able to play a longer tabletop game, and for listeners who'd want a short and snappy episode to listen to. Thus, reducing the downtime of learning the system and mastering it was all the more important. The thing is, the quiz sheet wasn't perfect. The harm system did away with normal points of health and instead had abstract conditions like 
winded or bloodied. This works really well in other systems, but because Quest and Show does away with traditional attributes, they didn't really fit. A lot of players saw it as a descending list of worsening ailments, which wasn't the case. Inventory 2 was also too complex. Characters had loadouts that further defined them, things that they always had on them, like a signature weapon, healing supplies or adventuring gear, but tracking what had been used and what they had picked up was rarely engaged with. Fortunately, neither issue really tripped the system up during gameplay. Granted, it could have created a situation where a player could keep generating money to solve all their problems, but that just meant, as the GM, I'd have to create situations where money wasn't the answer. Interestingly, a lot of things that weren't spelt out in the rules worked their way into the game. One of these examples was that taking harm could affect a role, but enough of it was factoring in a character's backstory into an action. There's no well-travelled skill or expertise, but one of the player characters was a scholarly archaeologist, so when they looked at old stonework, they could get a bonus on a read. On the flip side, a character who was described as comically large was at a disadvantage when trying to hide. In evaluating Quest and Show Season 1, I can see what worked and what didn't. Now, in Quest and Show Season 2, I could put that into effect. I've streamlined treasures and loadouts, reworked harm, and expanded the history section so players can give their characters even more detail. Whether it pans out in the long run, I guess we'll see. The point is, building a four-purpose role-playing game might not be as difficult as maybe you considered. In fact, it's quite easy to start from scratch and create something that you and your friends could feasibly play. In fact, I think we could probably do that right now, using Quest and Show as a starting point. Making your own RPG starts with a question. That question is why did I close my window? Making your own RPG starts with a question. What? As in, what kind of game do you want to run? The thing is, there's a lot of game systems out there, and plenty might be a perfect fit for whatever game you want to run. There's countless fantasy, science fiction and horror games out there that can recreate stuff like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars or Call of Cthulhu. For a first time GM, you might want to stick with something pre-made. But let's say for this experiment, you really want to create something unique. You might even be willing to cannibalise other games to make it work. So, let's start with the obvious question. Why PBTA then? At its core, the game is about the conversation. Mechanics like dice rolling are meant to affect the results of the decision that you have full autonomy over. Importantly, all players have some domain over their setting, either proactively through their moves or by filling in gaps in the lore. PBTA was my system of choice for Quest and Show for this very reason. After all, a podcast is often a conversation between two people or more, whether this show is topical, comical, retrospective, etc. It's also a system that I know very well by now, meaning that I could be confident in my own tweaks on it. So to start the conversation, we usually ask, what would you like to do? And this could be a proactive question, such as, where would you like to investigate next? Or a reactive question like, how would you like to defend yourself? The most base move of a PBTA game is the one that Quest and Show is built on. Some games call this Defy Danger, but essentially it's a catch-all, do a thing. You describe to your GM what you intend to do, and if there's a reason you'd maybe put at risk at doing so, you roll. The results are then split across three distinct outcomes. A 10 or higher is a pass. You do the thing. A 6 or lower is a failure. You don't do the thing. And in the middle, a 7 to 9 result is you do the thing, but. This but could be an unforeseen cost or complication. Say you do it, but you'll drop something, or hurt yourself, or make things worse for everyone else. You may give the player the choice to back out, or make another roll to deal with a new threat. As you can see, it's a move where things start to grow out as players can tackle this in a lot of different ways. As the GM, severity should be decided by the dice. 
A 7 to 9 result should be treated softer than a 6 or below in this case. Of course, every situation is different, such as getting shot versus getting punched. Even if you're fortunate to only be grazed by a bullet, you're still likely to take harm, while a punch could leave you dizzied or with a mouthful of blood. Don't see every failure as a chance to harm your players. After all, you're playing the game because you want to see their characters do cool things. Plus, there's far more interesting ways you can hurt them. You could stop with just that move. But the next step is to specify. In the case of Quest and Show, that move would be affected by the character sheets, their skills, history, palm, etc. This works very well for a simplified fantasy setting where someone might have dedicated themselves to being very good at both fighting and investigation, but it might not fit for something more about interpersonal relationships or bigger political moves. So depending on what type of game you're running, you may decide you want some moves that expand on just cost and complications. Say you want to actively hit a target. Instead of a 10 plus just being that your character does that and connects a punch, we could instead give the player a few effects to choose from. Maybe you steal something from them, or leave them dizzy and open to another attack. A 7 to 9 might not be a complication, but instead a lesser success. You can only choose one of these options with those unfulfilled effects potentially affecting your character. As you can see, it doesn't take a lot to start to develop an idea. If you have a particular vision in mind for a game, you can start with a few key elements and grow it from there. However, these hypotheticals can only go so far without a unifying vision. So let's say for this hypothetical game we're creating, we have a setting and an idea in mind. Recently, I found myself down the rabbit hole of watching the channel Scaredy Cats on YouTube, which often look at films from the golden age of slasher horror. You know the kind of films these are. Isolated location, unstoppable killer, a cast utterly unprepared to deal with the situation. Maybe not the most highbrow or even the most sensitive subject matter, but it is something that can fit nicely into a PBTA game. Of course, there are games like Monster of the Week, which is about playing a group of people fighting against supernatural forces, and Horror Movie World, which is built in mind for running games like this. However, because this is something we have full control over, we can streamline details and maximise others to fit our particular vision. So this hypothetical slasher game. The players would be the cast members in this world, and so would be at a constant threat of whatever this villain is but they'd also have the opportunity to stop the spree before it grows out of control. Lethality would, well, it's likely going to be high, but we could do things to mitigate that issue. After all, a great cast is one the guests to stick around and make their mark. So some basic moves would be things like defending yourself from attack, or finding a hiding spot, or escaping a situation. Great, but we still need a little bit more. So what else often happens in these movies? While often the townsfolk will band together, and the sheriff's department will investigate these strange attacks, perhaps friends of the victims may want to figure out a solution to a problem that only they seem to have noticed. So perhaps there should be a move to investigate a crime scene, so that they can analyse a pattern that they could use should they face this threat again. Maybe a means to interview people that would know more. Then we might want the ability for characters to help one another, maybe by means of distraction or applying medicine. Suddenly, we have a lot more options now for how this game will be played, and from there we can get even more specific. These classic movie archetypes, the town sheriff, the geek, the athlete, the survivor, the angelic, can be the basis of player classes, with their own specific moves. A sheriff is better equipped to look into a crime scene, so they may get a bonus when investigating, or they can ask more questions. The geek might be able to use their science knowledge to create something from scratch. The athlete, being such a great team player, might have a far more powerful move to help out another cast member. And we can use that framework of actions being rated from worst, best and but to figure out all kinds of answers to the player actions. These moves aren't designed to limit what they can say, but instead give a GM something to work from. Things like in-game currency might not be necessary, because how often does having the cash to purchase something affect the flow of a slasher movie? 
However, things like experience points would show how our cast are becoming more confident episode by episode as the threats mount up. How health is handled could also be played with. Perhaps instead of a standard harm system where you have, you know, so many points, these cast members could be affected by conditions as they fail to manage a threat. Getting cut could leave them bloodied, getting spooed could leave them shaken. They might not be able to think straight after a serious running with a threat, meaning their investigations will be subpar. And when these conditions grow unbearable, they are unfortunate easy prey. Now we have attributes to consider. You might want characters that are great at being able to overcome problems through physicality, or brain power, finesse, charm, or sheer dumb luck. Moves like investigations are better suited to the nerds than, say, getting in an attack, so they may have a higher brain score versus a higher strength or charm score. Of course, defending oneself could come down to whatever the player decides is best, thus leaving it down to a role of strength or brains or charm or whatever. Very quickly, we've created a rough structure that the rest of the game can be built around. These things will tweak and change as you playtest it, as players may want tweaks to particular moves and maybe new moves to fit actions they're always doing. Importantly, you may hone in on what the game does best. It's why there's titles like Monster Hearts and Masks, which are more about the interpersonal relationships of these characters against the backdrop of their fantastical premises, and games like Urban Shadows and The Sword, The Crown and The Unspeakable Power, which is a grand scheme of politicking. And all four of these games are built on the same PBTA framework. And the thing is, this is only one way to consider an approach to building a role-playing game. Things like rolling dice might not even be necessary, such as in Wonder Home, where making small actions that put the character in peril gives you the currency to make big and beneficial actions. Or even D&D, which have specific dice to change the shape of combat. It's the game that made the D20 famous, reason being that it represented a range of 0 to 100 in 5% increments, deciding how likely it'd be for your player character to hit. So even elements about how you play can be just as effective as what kind of moves or characters you have. Simply, building an RPG isn't that daunting, though it does raise the question of why you may want to do it. I think if you have the means and ability to do so, being able to craft your own rules and your own worlds is incredibly liberating. All PBTA games find their common ancestor in Apocalypse World, and the designers behind that game were very aware that that system that they built for their game of life in the barren landscapes of a broken future was something special. They don't require you to license their technology to make your own title, as long as you give due accreditation. It has allowed a lot of new talent to spill forth, many of whom have gone on to games that move past the restriction of PBTA that may have limited their best ideas. I haven't been GMing for very long, but I'd like to hope that these videos that I've been making about my experience have inspired maybe a few of you, either getting more people into tabletop stuff or trying out new things. And I really hope that this video gets a few people who may have considered wanting to run a game or making their own finally take the plunge. Like I said, it doesn't take long to get results. I'm still learning, and almost all of these experiments will affect things like Quest and Show and other projects going forward. So if you have any thoughts, or want to show off anything you've been working on, leave a comment below. Once again, in front of the webcam, I've been James, and I'll see you all in the next upload.